So today, let's go through uh, quickly our uh, kind of solutions to today's in-class activity. So we're look nucleating some precipitate particles, so particles of some radius uh, A, and below is a snapshot, and we can see that this cyan color right here indicates uh, the average size of the particle. So this is equal to our A is equal to A bar. So we know from our equations, and we could kind of look that up right here. So let's go to lecture six. We know from our Oswald ripening expression that, where are we at? Let's go over here. That if our A is, uh, if our A is less than A bar, we're gonna shrink. If our A is greater than A bar, we are going to grow. So uh, that's given by inside this expression right here. So let's go back to our new section. Oops, not that one. New section five. So here we know if A is greater than A bar, we're going to grow. If A is less than A bar, we are going to shrink. And so we need to place an X on particles that will shrink uh, and an O on particles that will grow. So these guys are going to grow. And these guys are all going to shrink. So X is going to shrink. So what particles have higher chemical potential? The X's or the O's. So we know that uh, from our expression, the chemical potential of the sphere is equal to mu naught of an infinite plate plus or minus uh, R2, oops, 2 gamma, uh, you know, GB uh, plus the molar volume. Oops. For some reason my screen is a little funky. Lately. So V, uh, molar volume over R. So the key thing here is this curvature. So we know that our kappa is equal to 2 over R for a sphere. So the larger the sphere, i.e. the larger the radius, um, the smaller the chemical potential. So we know that we move from high chemical potential to low chemical potential. So the X atoms are shrinking, and they're shrinking because the chemical potential of our X is much greater than the chemical potential of our circles. So, and that also kind of explains why we have that flux of the atoms. And in fact, if we were going to look at our Bell reaction curve as a function of some variable, so if we're going to hopping from here to here, we know that we're going to hop from our X to O. So we want to jump from here to here, not from O or our circles to our X's. So that would be kind of our labeling of those Bell reaction curves. Um, let's explain the shape of the curve below. So we see here, this is labeled R, but again, this is a volume term. So we know, let's go back to our notes, lecture six, that our average particle size will scale as T to the one third. So uh, that's our Oswald ripening expression. And we, see, we know that we have, that controls the slope is this D and T term right here. So let's go over here to our new section. Uh, and we are gonna see the following right here, right? So why is the slope linear? Because we're plotting basically a cubed as a function of t. We know that time's on this side, and then there's our slope here that's dictated by our diffusion over our kind of temperature. So that's why we kind of have that slope. So you wanna kind of explain that. And why is it changing as a function of temperature? Specifically, we see that as temperature increases, our slope is increasing. Well, the slope is controlled by this term, which is thus controlled by the diffusion over temperature. So that one over T can't compete with our diffusion, which is Arrhenius exponential minus Q A by K T. So this exponential, this Arrhenius growth in temperature will always beat out that one over T factor, hence the change in slope. Uh, so here it says these particles have nucleated from the melt in a special mold without a coating that prevents particle attachment um, to the side of the mold and the nucleation rate as a function of undercooling is shown below. So if there's no attachment, this is our homogeneous. Homogeneous. Why does the nucleation rate drop off at high and low undercooling? Well, we know that on this side of the curve at high undercooling, we have nucleation dominating because right here at zero is T is Tm. So nucleation dominates here, growth dominates here. And so we understand, right, that if we're at really, really high temperatures, we can grow easily, but there's no nucleation. At very, very, very low temperatures, i.e. high undercooling, we have lots of nuclei, but we can't grow. So that's why we kind of kill each other off, essentially, in those things. Draw the nucleation in the same finger, uh, figure above um, for the normal mode. Explain any difference. Will the Gibbs free energy at the critical radius change uh, between these two uh, molds? Why or why not? 
So if we have heterogeneous nucleation, we know that we're gonna be able to, basically, we are gonna be able, let's see, I'm gonna use a different color. So our peak can occur at lower amount of undercooling, i.e. higher temperatures. So this would be my normal or hetero, heterogeneous nucleation for the normal mode. Um, so we know, going back to our notes, that if you look at our G as a function of kind of our term, so for the blue curve, for homogeneous nucleation, it's going to be large like this. For the green curve, it's going to look exactly the same. Our R star, our critical value, is exactly the same, but our homogeneous nucleation is smaller, and it's smaller by the factor of S theta, which is going to be less than 1. So it depends on kind of the geometry and everything else that's going on there. Excellent. So... Uh, those are kind of the key values, uh, and then we looked at uh, today in class. So if you're given these multiple kind of curves, so you can kind of see this blue curve, if they're all from the same system, blue curve and green curve, this is homogeneous, this is the green curve would be heterogeneous. The other curves, what's the difference between the blue and the, you know, red and the, the gray? The gray, that critical radius is larger, right? And we know that our critical radius, so our R star, is proportional to 1 over delta T. So if we have less undercooling, we're going to have a larger critical radius in order to grow. So we're not going to grow as much. But if we have a super small uh, you know, critical radii, like in blue, we have large amounts of undercooling. So we know that this has you know, very, very low undercooling, low delta T. This has high delta T. And that has the red is medium in, uh, delta T, essentially. So we can kind of rank these values in between here. And then additionally, we said, what should be the slope here? So we remember that we had our, we have this square is proportional to t. So if you take the natural log of a power function, so r would be proportional to t to the one half. If you take the natural log of a power function, or not natural log, the log base 10 of uh, a power law, that slope is just going to be kind of put to the top there. And the y-intercept would be essentially where our little, whatever this factor is between here, this x, you know, so... Uh, but anyways, so the slope here would be equal to one half for 2D grain growth. For 3D grain growth, it'd be a third, you know, uh, and then again, this y-intercept would be whatever would be in the front of it. So looking back at our notes here, so the y-intercept for this problem, if we did 3D grain growth, would be everything here. So that would be what our y-intercept would give us. So you can see that that might change um, depending on uh, essentially your temperature values. So that's another kind of fun problem, maybe that might show up on an exam. So hopefully study those uh, and study those wrinkles. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks.